Hello, and welcome to the Mr. 50mm YouTube channel. I'm Mr. 50mm. You can call me Chris. So, I was browsing on the internet, as one is to do, trying to fill in the void, as one does. And I came across the Canon 1DS Mark I on eBay. It was listed as as is condition, but it looked like it was in pretty good shape. It didn't come with a battery or a charger. Not a big problem for me, because I have the 1DS Mark II, and the charger and battery arrangement are the same. So I submitted an offer for the 1DS Mark I for $100 US. And a few weeks later, this arrived in my inbox. And as it turns out, it would work just fine. So join me as we have a look at Canon's first full-frame DSLR, and why I uh, think for the right price, this might be a good alternative to the Canon 5D Mark I or the Canon 5D Classic, whichever one you want to call it. Let's get into it. What is the 1DS Mark I? Well, it's Canon's first ever for full frame DSLR. It was released in September of 2002, and it also happens to be the third ever production full frame camera, being beaten technically by the uh, Contax N Digital and the Kodak DCS 14N. The uh, 1DS features a 11.1 .1 megapixel full frame CMOS sensor. It has an ISO range of 100 to 1250, with an expanded option to give you an extra ISO 50 as an option. The camera has a Canon's 21 zone metering system, and the shutter is good for 30 seconds for up to 1 8,000th of a second. You can also sync the sync a flash at up to 1 250th of a second, and it has a burst rate of 3 frames per second for up to 10 frames. It takes the compact flash card as its storage, and its other party trick is that it's equipped with Canon's 45 point AF system with eight cross type points clustered in the center. I'll uh, show you a photo of uh, how the focus points are clustered down below, or, you know, overlaid on top of my face. I don't know. Now, the uh, Canon's finder is gorgeous. It's 100% uh, the uh, field of view, and it's an optical finder being a DSLR. Uh, being a digital camera, though, you get a LCD with 120 K dots in the back. Let's have a quick look at that. Look at the gorgeousness of all those pixels. So many. And being a uh, one series camera, it packs a uh, weather sealed uh, body. So it's good for rain and dust and other adverse conditions. Now, being an older camera, 2002, mind you, uses the older nickel metal hydride NPE3 battery packs. Uh, and when they were new, I think this was good for about a thousand shots. Pretty good. Now, this camera is quite weighty. You might have noticed it is a bit of a big chungus of a camera. It's got a nice thick profile. And, uh,. Looking straight on, it is no small camera. Now, what this means is that it comes in at a uh, weighty 1265 grams if you leave your battery at home, like so. But if, you know, you, uh, you don't leave your battery at home, it weighs in at 1600 grams. So, that being said, if you have your, st your camera body with no lens, no battery, it is roughly the weight of 1.26 Plena. But if you do decide that uh, batteries are useful, the camera will come in at roughly 1.6 kilo, almost 1.6 uh, times a Plena. Uh, and uh, what are that in pounds? Like 2,000 pounds? I don't know. It's a weird unit. Now, when the camera was new, this thing uh, had an MSRT of roughly $8,000 in 2002 dollars. That's roughly $13,800 uh, in 2024 monies. And that's in US buckaroos. In uh, Canadian rainbow dollars, that's actually $18,700 in modern monies. Ugh, that's a lot of money. So what's it like to use the 1DS Mark I? As with most, most bigger DSLRs, ergonomics are simply excellent. Comfort, 
in the hands is just good, and things tend to be really well balanced. The integrated grip also makes it easy to swap from portrait to landscape mode. Oop, like so. Right, just turn the camera and you're good to go. Now, if you aren't aware from all the other reviews of the original 1D or 1DS or 1DS Mark II and such, this camera is a two-handed operation for a lot of things, like navigating menus, switching shooting modes, and image review. Now, this is a carryover from the One series film cameras, like this one. And in principle, it makes sense. The idea is that uh, by acquiring a two-handed operation, you're less likely to accidentally change the setting. In practice, this does take getting used to, but once you have it stuck in your brain, it's not too bad. It's just initially a little more deliberate action than you might be used to. Let's have a look at what that's like. I'm gonna change the uh, ISO and I'll show you what you gotta do. So here we go. I have a look at top plate. We will also illuminate that for you. All right, hit the press two buttons here and then I can scroll the wheel and you should see it change. Let's see. So I'm pressing these two here, rolling this finger. Now, I will also demonstrate this on my EOS 1N film body. Now I know changing ISO on that kind of means something else because you actually have to change the film, but you know, it's changing the setting on the camera. Same thing, same thing. So let's have a look. Okay, so same idea. Let's get the camera in focus. There we go. And again, illumination is, let's re-illuminate. Okay, these two thingies go in here and my ISO is changing. So yeah, two-handed operation in theory helps you not accidentally change settings. So not all functions work like this. Of course, some of the ones that you'd expect uh, like your exposure compensation or just your rear thumb wheel, like like so. So, I know it's a little turned, but this will give you a view of my thumb and the display. And you can see the exposure comp is right here. All right, that might be hard to see, but trust me, I'm changing the, changing the exposure comp with the rear thumb wheel over here. By the way, this is an excellent style of command dial and also a holdover from old one series film cameras. So yeah, a lot of design cues from their old one film line there. Now, additionally, uh, when you look at the actual camera's control layout, it is really similar looking to basically every Canon DSLR ever made since they kind of borrow from the same design language and I'll turn it around and you'll have a look there. So the uh, command dial over here, as you might know on modern cameras, you might have a D-pad or whatnot, but generally there's a thing there and your row of buttons on your opposite side. Now, I don't think this actually has changed position in like a billion years, so that's still fairly similar. And you got your AF on button there and control dial just above your shutter, right? A lot of similar things that should be familiar for any, any Canon user. Now, I do want to bring up that the camera's files are stored in the TIFF container format, and some programs, uh, they do not like this. Uh, Raw Therapy does not like opening it. Uh, Dark Table does, but it kind of seems to underexpose everything. It doesn't. I don't think it's opening them properly, uh, but that's okay because you still got Canon Photo Pro, and the most current one on their website still opens the files, and it's free. So yay! Uh, I don't really like using it though, so kind of a negative point on the camera there. Now. A nice thing about the uh, One Series cameras is, uh, well, you know, there's a lot of nice things about the One Series cameras, but 
the AF system, it holds up today. The system is snappy and it tracks objects reasonably well. Now, I say I always say this in my reviews, you know, it's not equipped like a modern camera where the camera can ID a winking tick from 20 foot feet away, but it'll quickly lock onto stationary objects, no problem. And when you're doing sports, it can reasonably track people in cars doing their thing. Now, and this is all assuming that like the user knows how to set up the AF system in order to like, kind of accomplish that. Unlike, you know, the modern A7 6 or whatever, where you can just put it to like AI autofocus and then say like focus on people and it'll just go straight for the eyeballs. No, you don't, you don't have that level of simplicity, but if you know what you're doing, you can, uh, you can really easily still capture good photos with this system of some fast action. That being said, this camera is not a speed demon, you know, at three frames per second, uh, you're not going to be really spraying and praying, but if you time your shots well, it is actually usable to shoot with this camera and get some, uh, some action-y action shots. Now, so just to emphasize how good the One Series uh, AF system is, I always like shooting my 51.2 on, uh, on this camera, as you might have noticed, it's what's on there right now. And I can confidently say that most of the times, focus is nailed. Like, it's great. Now, speaking of the three FPS soundages, let's give that a go. Now, it is probably not gonna sound super brilliantly fast, but the camera on its own sounds quite excellent. So let's, let's have at it. Awesome. So the camera's ISO range, it sounds pretty limited, being stuck with a maximum of 1250 with no expansion upwards. Uh, the ISO is straight out of a camera, you know, the uh, images do bring some noisy noise, but you know, even with Canon software, you can get a pretty good uh, cleanup of the files if you do need to shoot at these higher numbers. So if you do get one of these, I honestly don't think it'd be terrible if you had to push it a stop or two. You know, it's, it's not a noise champion by any means, but it's workable. Now, dynamic range, it's another area that, you know, these older cameras generally tend to surprise me. Now, it it's reasonably solid. It's not blow your mind away kind of stuff, but it's not like it's substantially worse than like modern-ish Micro Four Thirds cameras, like, you know, one or two generations back. And with proper care for exposure, you, it's more forgiving than you'd think given how old the camera is. Now, one thing I did notice about the uh, RAWs that come out of the camera is that they're kind of a bit less sharp than what you might expect to get. Uh, but I do think it's just the uh, inbuilt engine not sharpening up the files because once you check the uh, sharpening option on a Digital Photo Pro, they sharpen up pretty well. Now, the resolution of the camera, it's very nice. Now, I know it sounds funny coming from me, a guy that reviewed a two megapixel Kodak DSLR, but Trust me, it's enough. No, it's not like the Sony 61 megapixel full frame, uh, but if you're viewing on a computer, on a phone, even on a big bum bum 4K TV, they look great. Now, it just isn't, uh, there's not a huge amount of cropping power on the sensor, but at the same time, the lower resolution kind of means that you won't immediately hit the diffraction limit on, uh, on your lenses and you won't require infinitely expensive glass to resolve the uh, sensor. So there's some pros to this. Additionally, as per the uh, pro cameras of the time, you get a voice annotation with your camera, so you can leave a little message for yourself about your pics. I I've never really used it, but you know, let's, uh, I'll jam a clip down below and we'll have a listen. Hello. This is Mr. 50 Millimeter leaving a uh, voice annotation on one of my photos. Okay, so the last thing I want to show you is uh, that the Canon Pro Series cameras, they all do one thing that I think is pretty neat. And that is that the LCD backlight is an amazing blue color. Honestly, worth its weight in uh, in the camera. Here, I'll show you. You, might have, you already saw it when I pulled it up earlier, but 
now we're actually going to showcase this. So there we go. We got that blue. And it sh shows up on the rear LCD as well. So why is it a good alternative to the 5D? Before we get started though, I do want to frame this a little bit. I've shot with the 5D in the past. When I had my uh, 5D Mark II, I quickly became interested in uh, various cameras. And one of the ones that I ended up buying was the original 5D Mark I. I actually stuck with this camera for a lot longer than most of the other cameras I had purchased and sold and purchased and resold. Uh, I do admit that it was a long time ago, probably in the range of the 2010s, 2011s. Uh, so the opinion isn't formed out of no experience with the original 5D. It is formed from old experience with the 5D from long ago. So trust my memory. Now, first thing I do want to point out compared to the 5D, and it makes a difference even given the fact that I'm recalling, I have to recall this from my memory hole, is the AF system. The, there's a massive chasm of difference between the 1DS and the 5D. It is noticeable. On paper, the uh, 5D technically will work to a little bit of uh, lower light scenarios, but I remember distinctly the 5D and the 5D Mark II system, they're fairly similar, it was uh, significantly slower to uh, respond, and it was more like wishy-washy than the One Series cameras, which, you know, you point the camera somewhere and it immediately locked on. Like, whoop. immediate. It's pretty good. Now, if you're just comparing the uh, center points of the cameras, the 5D and the 1D, I guess they're probably reasonably close, but I still think the 1DS just, it moves, it moves along and more confidently locks on. Now, if you're tracking any kind of moving subject though, that's where the 1DS will absolutely body the 5D cameras with its measly nine points and six invisible assist points, whatever that means. It was really not great at tracking motion. The 1DS will still carry itself where the 5D will, it will not. Now, another another nicety is that the 1DS Finder, like I said, is 100% field of view coverage, whereas the 5D Classic or 5D Mark One is 96%. Magnification on the 1DS is like, 0.7 times, whereas the 5D is 0.71, like a tiny difference. But really what makes the makes up the difference though is that coverage. The 100% coverage on the 1DS is a joy to work with. Thirdly, weather sealing. The 5D Mark I technically didn't have weather sealing. Although I have taken my 5D out in uh, some poopy conditions uh, and poopy days, it didn't, didn't technically have weather sealing where the uh, one series camera bodies are loaded to the gills with the weather sealing, and you can see it on the buttons. That's how it will look. You can see all the buttons have little little rubber gaskets all around them, and it's like that throughout the entire camera. So you can rest assured, be very uh, comforted knowing that in poor conditions with a well-matched lens like this 50 1.2, the camera will deal well in that scenario. Now, the other thing that attributes a little bit to the weather ceiling is the build quality of the One Series cameras. It's, it's just amazing. Now, it's not to say the 5D is bad. The 1DS, it's just better. Everything feels better in hand. The, the camera itself feels more solid. And you get the blue backlight. Pretty awesome. Uh, yeah, definitely better than the amber color you get on the 5D. Maybe that's just me. I don't know. Lastly, we're going to talk about price and the condition of the used cameras in the used camera pool. Now, the 1DS tends to go for around $100 to $250, depending on uh, whether or not you get a charger or a functioning battery. Now, the 5D tends to be closer to 200 to $300. And just looking around, I know the 1DS pool is smaller. The cameras, after all, were significantly more money when they're new, 
However, looking at what's available, the 5D cameras that are out there tend to be in rough shape. A lot of them are in rougher shape than the 1 Series cameras. That may be partly due to the uh, 1 Series having better build quality and kind of taking a piece of it better, but I also think partly is just that the 5 Series camera bodies might have just seen a lot more time with a lot more people, so they get banged up more. Now, the price for the uh, 5D is also pro a little higher, probably because, you know, there's been recent excitement about this camera and recent like, excitement about older cameras in general, and it, that doesn't seem to have spread to the 1DS Mark I yet, so it might be a good opportunity to pick one of them up. But what ways does the 5D have the advantage? Well, the first one that's obvious is the tiny the resolution bump. It's a bit small, you know, 12.8 to 11.1, but that isn't nothing. And uh, the other things that come, come to mind immediately are the uh, camera navigation. So using the uh, camera in general, the UI of the 5D, it's going to be much more familiar. It inherits the system that was from the 20D and 30D. So, you know, anyone that has used 5D or Canon DSLRs that weren't the one series cameras in the past, it will be much more familiar with the 5D menu structure and the interfaces. Since the uh, two-handed operation was actually kind of abandoned after the 1DS Mark II and the 1D Mark IIn. Uh, even, so basically what I'm saying that is that even the one series cameras moving forward, like the 1DX, the 1DS Mark III, 1D Mark III, whatever, they ended up adopting the interface that was more akin to the 5D, where you didn't have your two-handed operation anymore. And it generally meant that changing settings, navigating the camera, doing things overall was just faster and more intuitive. So, you know, the 5D gets an edge there in familiarity. Now, Overall, the 5D was more techno technologically more advanced. It therefore reaped benefits in uh, noise processing. So in higher ISOs, the 5D Mark I does perform better, and it has a larger ISO range. When it's expanded, you get 50 to 3200, right? And the rear LCD on the 5D, it's much more usable than the 1D uh, rear, rear LCD. It's not perfect by any means. It's still an ancient display, but, you know, focus checking, Instagram looking, it's generally more easy, it's doable and clear just because it's a larger display. Now, the last couple of points I do want to bring up is that the 5D Classic uses the basically infinitely renewable BP 511 batteries. They're super cheap, right? And then you can still buy them today. Whereas the 1DS batteries, while they're still produced, kind of significantly cost more. A single 1DS battery, that pack, costs about 30 US dollars on Amazon, whereas for about $20, you, you'll be able to get a, a two pack of BP 511s. And another bonus for the 5D, these raw files that the 5D makes, basically anything can open them. Pretty sure you can open these things up on paint. They're, they're kind of awesome, right? Now, finally, the last advantage for the 5D is the big body shape, right? Well, sorry, the disadvantage of the 1D and the advantage of the 5D is that the body shape is smaller. The 1DS is the big old square, as you see, and it is very cool, it is very nice, and it looks great. But that 5D form factor, it's something that I actually generally prefer since it just fits better in most camera bags, and if you really do want to embiggen the 5D, you can buy the battery grip, shunk it on the bottom, and now you have yourself a big square as well, but it's optional. So you can pull it off and have yourself something more compact that you can toss into a bag more easily.
To conclude, yes, I do think the 1DS is an excellent alternative to the 5D Classic. In spite of some of the weird 1D quirks, its image quality is still very nice, the AF system is absolutely rockin', and even though that rear LCD fights to pull you back down to the year 2002, overall, it's a great camera. As it stands with the price gap between the uh, two cameras, I think if you can find a uh, cheap 1DS, I would take it over a uh, 5D Classic. But let me know when you choose, 1DS Mark I or 5D Classic. Otherwise, that's it for this video. And don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe. Till next time, bye.